right, so we have with us today a visitor from many hours away, if we were trying to drive it. <laughs> we just had a student actually up where, where in his building uh, last week doing some research. Uh, so anyhow, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Joshua Feinberg, who comes to us from the University of Minnesota. And he is here uh, via the Mineralogical Society of America's Distinguished Lecturer Program. Uh, each year they fund three people to go out and visit universities and give presentations. And so we're happy to have their support. Uh, and the, they cover all of the, the travel costs to get the speakers to and from. And then the local schools, so in this case the Department of Physical Sciences it picks up the local costs, so that's their co-sponsor. And uh, Josh Feinberg, you might know, uh, realize and see the word magnetism in there in his talk. So that's his specialty, uh, various forms of, of rock and mineral magnetism. And there are, of course, a great many different kinds of applications. Uh, some of the classic applications are things like the, the classic sort of uh, magnetic compass. Uh, it's like, OK, has this plate moved since that lava flow came out? Uh, that kind of thing. But there's a whole lot more to it than that. And so we're happy to have uh, Josh Feinberg here to tell us about these things. And we have this uh, live streaming on YouTube right now. And there's also simultaneously a Zoom teleconference meeting running. Uh, and so we were expecting to have a few remote participants. And uh, they'll have the opportunity to be able to ask questions via the Zoom interface uh, later on. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you all so much for, for being here and for the invitation to, to come and, and visit Concord. Uh, at any point during this talk, please feel free to raise a hand, ask a question. I love being interrupted to, to try and make things a little bit clearer. So thanks for the, the introduction as well. Uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit about how we use magnetic minerals to try and understand all different kinds of aspects of the environment, uh, our place in it, our history as archaeology and climate change in the future. Um, I'm going to be talking about a lot of different things. I promise by the end of this talk, you'll know what this slide all means. So this is meant to be a teaser for, for what's coming your way. So I just want to start off with the idea that no matter where you look at any kind of natural material, and even most of the engineered materials that humans make, there's always a little bit of a trace of, of magnetic minerals in there. And usually, if we can measure something about those minerals, we can learn something about the process or the material properties there. So if you're looking at meteorites, if you're looking at ice, if you're looking at speleothems, like stalagmites and caves, you're always going to find some little trace of magnetic minerals that are there. Even organisms are producing uh, magnetic minerals. Humans are thought to actually produce magnetic minerals in their brains as well. I'll touch on that a little bit later. So it's a really exciting time to be studying magnetic minerals. This picture in the background here, what you're seeing is the broad outline of two of a single parent cell that's in the process of cell division, mitosis. And it's a kind of particular bacteria that produces magnetic minerals inside its cell walls to actually use as a magnetic compass. And when it divides into two parent into two daughter cells, it actually divides up those magnetic minerals equally as well. So we'll touch on those as we're coming along in a little bit. So a roadmap for today's talk, this is a really nice crystal of magnetite in the background. It's one of our most strongly magnetic minerals that are out there. I want to talk for a little while about why some materials are magnetic. There's a lot of iron-bearing compounds out there in the world, but only some of them are capable of hanging on to a permanent magnetization. Uh, some of the things that Steve just mentioned in his introduction, how can these magnetic minerals be used to try and understand things about the Earth's magnetic field? That's a really important aspect about our planet. And a lot of what we know about our magnetic field comes from the recordings of these kinds of minerals. So I want to spend a little bit of time reviewing that. For the geologists in the room, that's probably the area that you're already most familiar with. But then there's a whole bunch of other applications that we can use magnetic minerals for that I wanted to, to talk about. And I'm excited about all of these. What I'm trying to make sure I do is most of the work that I'm going to be talking about is not my own research. Some of it is, and you'll see my name and my student's name a couple of different places. But this is just meant to try and show everything that my community, the magnetic mineral community, is actually working on right now that I think, I hope, will be interesting to all of you. Uh, so here we go. So why are some materials magnetic? It's because they contain specific minerals like magnetite, the ones that I mentioned earlier. But there are other ones too, things like hematite that makes rust colors red, 
Uh, Gertite is something that makes soils kind of yellowish in color. Iron sulfides are al also very, very common. Anytime you have a wetland area, you're forming another mineral, gertite as well. It's an iron oxyhydroxide. All of these minerals have some form of permanent magnetization. There's a lot of different ways that materials can be magnetic. If you think about uh, the spin of the electrons around an iron atom, those are what are giving materials their magnetic properties. And if the spins around an iron atom are really far apart, they can't communicate with one another. So you sort of get a random distribution of magnetic vectors associated with each one of those electrons. And there's no real net moment. We call that paramagnetic. If you were to apply a strong magnetic field, all of those arrows would line up with the field. But as soon as you took the field away, they would all relax. And they would go back to no net magnetization. And so things like olivine that have a lot of iron in them, those are paramagnetic minerals. But then there are other minerals, like the ones that I'm showing up here, where the iron atoms are a little bit closer to one another. And they can actually coordinate all of those electron spins. And by doing that, you can see how they could actually build up to have a nice big net moment. Sometimes they can be perfectly opposite one another, and you can have zero net moment there. Other times, you can have two different sublattices, and you can still have a net moment there. So the purpose of this slide is just to show that you can have different ways of arranging those, those tiny little uh, magnetic moments in your mineral that can produce a variety of different behaviors. So if you have some of these minerals in your material, there are three ways that the rock or the sediment can actually record something about the Earth's magnetic field. It can do it depositionally, chemically, or, or thermally. And I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about the depositional and the thermal, because those are the easiest ones to, to try and describe. In a depositional environment, just imagine a water column. It can be a lake, it can be an ocean, it can be a puddle. It doesn't really matter so much. But the idea is if you have any magnetic minerals that are so settling down through that water, or through the air column for that matter either, and they're in the presence of the Earth's magnetic field, as they settle, the population of those minerals is going to align themselves parallel to that applied field that's there. And then once those minerals hit the sediment water interface, they're actually going to lock in that magnetization. And ideally, unless there's a lot of compaction or anything else, it'll actually preserve that depositional remnants in some way so that we can actually come back and, and view that a little bit later on. So that's a depositional kind of remnants. Thermal magnetization is a little bit different. Uh, hopefully some of you guys have heard about this in your class. The classic example is a lava flow that records the Earth's magnetic field as it cools. So I'm going to show you a little movie here uh, off in the, the bottom left-hand corner that is meant to show the sort of nucleation and growth of minerals in a magma and how they acquire a magnetization. And so there's a couple of points here. The blue arrows that you're seeing right there those are meant to show the Earth's magnetic field orientation while the magma is cooling. The little thermometer is meant to be a qualitative measure of how hot the magma is at any given time. And then these little crystals are, are going to be what's actually growing. And you're going to see that when the crystals of magnetite first start nucleating and growing in the lava, they're going to be switching their magnetizations very, very, very fast. But then as it cools, that switching process is going to slow down rather dramatically. And in the end, they're going to acquire a net statistical alignment with the, the applied field. So here goes. There's the growth of the magnetite. The temperature is starting to cool. You can see the magnetization of each of those tiny little grains flipping back and forth in kind of a binary way. And then as the temperature continues to cool and cool and cool, eventually each grain's magnetization gets locked in. And so by the time you get down to sort of room temperatures, where we can actually pick up a, a sample of this stuff, you see that everything is frozen in place. Now, no individual grain is perfectly aligned with the ambient field. But if you were to add up each one of those tiny little vectors which, within those grains, the net alignment would be parallel to the applied field. And so that's how thermal magnetization actually gets acquired. So how do we actually use this kind of information in the field? Uh, we collect oriented samples from all around the world. This is not a picture of a man peeing on a rock. This is a picture of us actually collecting oriented samples of a, a long, cooled uh, basaltic lava flow. What this guy is using, this is a, an old uh, colleague of mine, a mentor of mine. Uh, what he's using is actually a modified chainsaw. This is what we get to use in paleomagnetism. We take a chainsaw, we take the bar and the chain off the chainsaw. So we just have the engine and a rapidly rotating tiny little chuck. And then we put on a hollow coring drilling bit. And at the very edge of the, the coring bit, it's studded with industrial diamonds. So just really, really hard materials. And then we can walk up to an outcrop like this. Bob is one of the more acrobatic samplers that I know. So not everybody is sort of doing that fine balancing thing. 
But then you walk up and you literally push the coring drill into the outcrop and then slowly pull it back out. And we run water through the inside of the coring bit to keep it cool so the, the bit doesn't melt and the diamonds don't get worn away. But what you're left with is a tiny cylinder of rock that's still attached to the outcrop. And then what we're going to do before we take that cylinder of rock out is we're going to actually scribe the side of it and label it in a bunch of very careful ways using an orientation tool so that when we bring it back to the lab, we can reorient the, uh, the sample in space and actually figure out what its magnetization is. So when we slide this device into the hole that has been made by the coring bit, that's what we do. Some rocks, like lava flows, are really magnetic, and so we measure their orientation with respect to the shadow cast by the sun at the time that we're actually collecting the, the sample. It's a shadow caster, which is kind of fun. So we take all of our little cylinders of rock back to our labs. We cut them so they're all about the same height, and they can all fit into our, our magnetometers. And these are the sort of orientation marks that allow us to mathematically reorient the, the samples in the lab. We use instruments that are incredibly sensitive magnetometers to, to measure the recording that these samples actually have. So these are what are called three-axis squid magnetometers. It's just a fancy term that describes uh, the basis for the, how these magnetometers work. It's a, a little superconducting loop of wire. Anytime you bring a permanently magnetized object past a superconductor, it induces a current, and you measure that as your signal. So if you have one loop for the x-axis, another one for the y, another one for the z, you can get the full three-dimensional magnetization vector of your sample, which is kind of fun. But they're incredibly sensitive. So most geochemistry instruments are measuring things at parts per million, parts per billion, sometimes if you're lucky, parts per trillion. Here we're measuring the concentration of magnetic minerals at parts per quadrillion. Usually it's really incredibly sensitive. It's very, very nice. How does a, a paleomagnetic study work? This is the kind of field areas that my community typically works in. These are the, the Columbia River flood basalts in the Pacific Northwest. So what you might do if you were trying to understand the Earth's magnetic field behavior through time is you would have a team of, of field workers with you with those kinds of drills that I was just describing. And you would approach each one of those lava flows that you're seeing on the screen right now. And you'd collect a, a population of samples from each flow, bring them back to the lab, and measure what the orientation of the magnetization was. You could see if it's parallel to today's field, in which case we'd call that normal. Or you could see if it was reversely magnetized. And so in the end, what you might get is this sort of stratigraphy of when you would have normal magnetization in sort of white and a reverse magnetization in black. You can compare that to records of reversals in time and actually date very precisely all the lava flows that you're looking at. So that's sort of a, a standard kind of paleomagnetic study approach where you have these incredible stratigraphic successions that you try to sample in as much detail as you possibly can. So with information from studies like that, we know a lot about the Earth's magnetic field. We know that it's primarily a dipole. So if you've all done the experiment when you're little kids with the iron filings around a, a magnet, that's often the way we conceptualize the Earth's magnetic field as well. But the, the North and the South Pole don't necessarily line up with the rotation, the geographic axes of the planet. There's always a little bit of a, a random walk that the, the Earth's actual magnetic field does around the geographic poles. We know they reverse occasionally. The, the reversal process itself usually takes around 3,000 to 15,000 years long to go from one orientation to the other. Uh, but we don't have a good way of predicting when it's going to actually reverse. There are some folks in my community who are convinced that we are right now going through the beginning stages of a geomagnetic reversal because the strength of the field for the, about the last 150 million years has lost 20% of its overall uh, value. And so we're starting to see that decrease that might presage a, uh, a reversal. We'll see. But over long time scales, millions of years, hundreds of thousands of years, we can assume that both the, uh, the geomagnetic poles and the geographic poles coincide, which is kind of nice. So we can use this information in all different kinds of ways. Uh, observing the magnetism on the ocean floor, for example, was one of the, the ways that we first observed that there were these geomagnetic reversals that could be recorded by the oceanic crust. You guys all know what spreading centers are, for the most part? Getting some head nods around the audience. These are where oceanic crust is spreading apart, often in the middle of the oceans and upwelling hot rock comes in and cools down, sort of a conveyor belt. This is what the data actually kind of look like. And you can see that there's some symmetry to the data there. And then when we make cartoons about this process for textbooks, we convert that real data into images that look like that. Uh, but this is what we're actually dealing with in terms of how the magnetization actually works. 
But this was, this was how we actually started to, to realize uh, and give, give sort of support for the idea of plate tectonics way back in the, the 40s and 50s. Do you guys know why people were measuring the magnetism of the oceanic crust? Does anybody know that stuff? What was that? It was, oh, come on, guys. You got to jump in. Yeah, it, it's, it's submarine navigation during World War II. Uh, it was different countries wanted to be able to navigate underwater. And they were hoping to actually use the, the magnetic field of the Earth to do it. And they, they actually found this information coming out of that. So from all this, we can actually piece together uh, chronologies of how old the oceanic crust is around our planet. So the cooler colors are the older crust. So the oldest bits of crust that we have are sort of adjacent to, to Asia over there, and then on the Atlantic seaboard over there. So that, in a really fast nutshell, has been the sort of paleomagnetic focus for a lot of my community for many, many years. But everything I'm going to talk to you for the rest of today is not this at all. It's about other applications of, of magnetic minerals. And so I want to try shifting gears here a little bit. And I want to tell you other ways that we use magnetic minerals in, in natural materials and, and urban environments as well to try and understand the environment. So the reason I'm showing you this picture of a tailpipe is whenever you tap your brakes and the, the brake pads are struck in some way to start slowing down the car, you actually create a little tiny cloud of new magnetic minerals, of little iron oxide minerals that are coming off your brake pads. And those particles are really small. They get suspended in the air column very, very easily. And they can move around, and they can actually become a public health hazard. Uh, and so this sort of leads naturally into this idea of particulate air pollution, for the most part. This is a picture of London relatively recently. And so the idea here is that particles suspended in the air from combustion, from industrial processes, from soil farming as well, just plowing things up, they actually generate an enormous amount of dust. And Within the US, there are a lot of state and federal agencies that actually monitor the amount of particulate air pollution that's out there. And in particular, they're actually looking for grain sizes that are 10 microns or less and 2.5 microns or less. And so sometimes you'll see these PM10, PM2.5 abbreviations. That's what it means. It refers to the diameter that people are actually monitoring this stuff. And these are important sizes because particle PM10 when you inhale it, if it actually gets into your lungs, that's small enough to actually pass through your lung tissue into your bloodstream. The reason that PM2.5 is particularly important for public health is if you breathe it in, it's small enough to actually go through your olfactory nerve and uh, go into your, your brain. And there's been all kinds of studies that have linked sort of exposure rates uh, of these different kinds of particle sizes to various il illnesses and, and sort of public health hazards. So this is kind of why these kinds of particulate air uh, issues are important. The air particles that are generated from transportation, from combustion, and industrial processes are all linked to high concentrations of heavy metals. This is a really important point. Uh, they also have a high concentration of something called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. These are all health hazards uh, that we need to be able to track. And so Exposure to these to elevated level of these kinds of really small particles are linked to things like asthma, lower mental development indices, neuroinflammation, that's the sort of idea of particles getting up into your brain. And ultimately, those particles in your brain can lead to things like Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease, uh, which is really scary. And so there's a lot of importance for trying to understand how these really fine-grained minerals are actually moving around and where they settle. And that's where magnetism can actually be used to try and address some of these questions. So this is trying to just sort of set up a, a problem that, that's important to society. So one of the, the reasons that magnetism is useful is because these iron oxides that are being generated by all these processes are magnetic. And so if there's an easy way to measure the magnetism or the magnetic properties of dust, then we can actually start to quickly measure how quickly it's spreading around. So one of our easiest measurements that we have is something called magnetic susceptibility. It's a little bit of a busy slide. Bear with me. Uh, the technical definition that we have is it's how much a material can be magnetized when you apply a magnetic field. But more simply, it's just a, a proxy or a, an estimate of the amount of magnetic material in a sample. So if you have a high susceptibility, you have a lot of magnetic material in your sample. If you have a low susceptibility, low. This is the, the equation that we use. So we have an applied field that's generated by an instrument. And we measure the induced magnetization in the sample. For those of you who really like thinking about units, I give you units. 
These are amp meters squared per kilogram, amps and meters, meters cubic, cubic meters per kilogram, those kinds of things. In the lab, we're just using a really simple instrument like this, where we have a simple, uh, it can be a soil sample, it can be a rock sample, it can be an air filter uh, that is lowered into a measurement area. We measure its induced magnetization, and then we measure the background, and then we get a susceptibility. In the field, we just use a simple handheld device. These are great because they're portable. You can collect lots of data with them. It's doing roughly the same thing. It's measuring background and induced susceptibility. And you can get data sets that look kind of like this. So what's happened here is somebody has taken one of those portable susceptibility meters, and they've collected a grid of data points adjacent to a road surface. And they're showing you how hot the, the, sensitive, the susceptibility is down here. And this gets across in a really visual way where that particulate dust is actually settling from the side of the road. So you can imagine people braking or cars just churning out tiny little bits of, of atmospheric dust from their, from their engines. And most of it settles immediately adjacent to the road. That's where you're getting the highest points. And it starts to taper off. And then there's this tiny little dirt road where tractors occasionally go as well. And so you get a little bit of a hot spot there. The reason that these kinds of things are useful is because this instrument costs about $2,000. It's not very expensive. And you can get nice high resolution maps very quickly that then allow you to focus where you collect geologic or, or geochemical samples to actually measure uh, things like heavy metal concentrations. So it's a way of quickly figuring out where you need to spend more time studying. There's a, a nice concentration, or a nice relationship, rather, between susceptibility and important metals in the environment. So this is mercury, this is lead. And these are both on log-log scales. That's an important detail to keep in mind there. But the basic takeaway message from these plots is the higher the concentration of metals uh, in a soil, in general, the higher the concentration or the higher the susceptibility is as well. So there's that nice relationship there. Along these lines, there was a, a relatively recent study out in Bulgaria. Bulgaria has some of the worst air pollution problems in all of Europe. And what they tried to do is they tried to survey they didn't want to just do a small little study by the highway. They actually wanted to know, can we learn more about the overall dust uh, sort of requirements across the entire country? And so they chose six of the, the biggest cities in, in Bulgaria, including the capital, Sofia, but also their biggest industrial center, which is Burgas, right over there. And they collected hundreds of samples uh, in all of the, each of those cities there. They collected dust samples from the tops of window sills in schools, from the tops of doors, even from the tops of, of some vending machines as well. And these were all places where you're supposed to have dust accumulate without it ever being washed away necessarily by rain or anything like that. But they wanted to compare things like how much dust was inside, how much dust was immediately outside, and for those samples that were in proximity to roads, what was the susceptibility like in those places? And the takeaway from this slide is that pretty much all of them had relatively low and similar susceptibilities, except for that one big industrial center, Burgas, right over there. And the other funny thing about it is, in most cases, the outdoor dust had the highest susceptibility at most of these places. And the indoor dust uh, was actually significantly lower. And that makes sense, right? If you're inside, most of the outdoor dust should be settling out and not getting inside. But the ratio between the indoor dust and the outdoor dust in Burgos was kind of different from all those other places. And when they looked at the dust, what they found were the evidence of all these different industrial processes that I had mentioned earlier. These are iron and carbon spheres from diesel exhaust that they were finding, even in indoor dust from schools and such. And they found elevated concentrations of things like arsenic and copper and lead. And in other places, they found these kinds of really tiny little magnetite spheres. Uh, and they have this really nice texture. It's called a dendritic texture. It's that like feathery mineral texture that you're seeing right there. That's a texture that forms when things are quenching from being really, really hot and then all of a sudden being solidified very, very quickly. And these had elevated concentrations of things like nickel and cobalt and, and chromium. They found this nice, nice, this is not, that's not the right word to use. They found a startling relationship between the ratio of the susceptibility indoors versus outdoors and the number of, of deaths attributable to uh, cardiac disease or cardiovascular disease. And so for those places that had very, very low ratios, where the indoor dust had a much lower susceptibility than the outdoor dust, uh, there were relatively low mortality rates. And then as you moved up, where indoor started to approach the outdoor levels of dust, the mortality rates starting to increase. 
And so this is not necessarily to say that it's the dust that's causing the mortality rates, but it is a useful way of establishing correlations that can be used by the public health community in a very quick way to try and estimate where there may be problems. So it was an unusual use uh, of mineral magnetism there. We can do this all over the world. It doesn't have to just be Bulgaria. This is a, a study that was done in Mexico and in Manchester, England. These were tiny little magnetite spheres that are coming out of a, a diesel engine. If you look at the scale bar there, it's 50 nanometers. For, for reference, uh, the average human hair width is 1,000 nanometers. So this is much, much, much smaller than the width of a hair. You would never be able to, to necessarily even see these particles if you were breathing them in. But they're so small that they would actually be easily inhaled and could actually potentially get incorporated into your tissues. Uh, that same study also looked at, at other kinds of sources of, of magnetic minerals, and we see more of these magnetite spheres, some more of those tiny little high temperature dendrites, all kinds of stuff. But what was also surprising is in those same areas, uh, they did a, a study on the magnetic properties of brain tissue uh, for people who had recently passed away living in those same areas, and they found those same particles there as well. And so there is definitely a link between those particles being in the environment and them being incorporated into uh, human tissue. So that's sort of a, a quick example of how magnetic minerals are actually being used to study sort of pollution pathways and how they interfere with uh, humans and human society. I want to transition a little bit here. I want to transition away from this idea of thinking about using magnetic minerals as tracers of pollution and start thinking a little bit more about how magnetic minerals occur in organisms a little bit more broadly and maybe in a little bit less sinister way than what I've been showing so far. So here's a happy snail picture instead <laughs> of that recent uh, sort of mortality study. This is a kind of gastropod or a snail that lives adjacent to deep sea hydrothermal vents. It's actually producing magnetic minerals there as part of the radula of the, the snail's tissue there. This is what it actually uses to hunt nearby animals and actually rasp away at shells and things like that to actually get into uh, to eat. It's what they use to prey with. Uh, they're using magnetic minerals in this case because they are in thermodynamic equilibrium with this really unique uh, geologic environment. We find all kinds of other forms of magnetic minerals in organisms, though, as well. Have you all heard of mag magnetotactic bacteria before? Has anybody heard of these kinds of things? So what you're seeing is a microscope image of a single little bacterium, right? And the little trail of, of dots that you're seeing there, those are all little tiny magnetic minerals. Those are magnetite. They're all lined up. They're held together by a single protein filament. Otherwise, they would just sort of clump up together by their, their magnetism. And what the, these organisms are actually doing is they're actually using them as compasses. Uh, they want to know which way the Earth's magnetic field is oriented. The way that these compasses work is all of these minerals are aligned so that their crystallographic axes are all pointing in the same direction. And so all of their, it's almost like link, linking magnets together. You get a really nice, strong magnetic field. These are showing the magnetic field lines around these kinds of what are called magnetosomes. If you wanted to see what those things look like in 3D, we have a, a tomography image uh, right there. This is what these, these minerals actually look like inside the bacterium. And so what they're actually doing is they're, they're using this to try and find the, their optimal living conditions. These bacteria like to live right at the boundary between well oxygenated waters in a lake or a, a, an ocean environment and anoxic conditions. And so they want to find that oxygenated anoxic transition zone. And so if you imagine that you are a bacterium floating around in, a, in the ocean or a lake or something like that, and you have little cilia that are, allow you to propel yourself through the water column, if you need to try and find that zone and you don't have eyeballs, it's a really hard energetic problem. You only have so much energy to your cell, it's hard to actually find that zone. But if you have something like magnetoreception, that allows you to figure out which way the, the magnetic field is pointing. You turn that three-dimensional problem into a one-dimensional problem, and you can just move down into that zone. And so that's what we think the bacteria are actually doing. A lot of other organisms, big multicellular organisms, have some form of magnetoreception that they use for navigation across big areas of the planet. So birds, turtles, sharks are some examples. Ah, oh, right, there's this video that I was going to show as well. This is a video of the bacterium that we were just talking about right here. These are all tiny little black dots of, that are showing the, the bacteria in themselves. 
what the video is about to show is uh, an, a scientist bringing a magnet close and all of the bacterium swimming towards the magnet and they'll pull the, the magnet away and the bacterium will, will scatter to a different place. When I played this video for the first time earlier this week in front of another audience, I was incredibly startled because there's some kind of exciting music that goes along with it. If that happens here, brace yourself. I've tried to turn off the sound, but I can't promise it's really going to be off, so we'll go with it. So the magnet's been pulled away, and then the magnet's going to come back here in a second. You can see them all starting to cluster near the, the edge of this, uh, this droplet, and then the magnet goes away. It's intense, I know, I apologize for that. One of the things that is kind of fun to watch about those kinds of movies is that when the magnet comes close to that little water droplet that contains all of those bacteria, uh, most of those bacteria swam towards the magnet. But did you all see that there were a small minority that swam away when the magnet was coming close? About 10% of all these bacteria are misaligned with the, the magnetic field. They're like the misfits. And the idea that evolutionary biologists have put forward for why that's actually a useful trait to have a small minority is when the Earth's magnetic field reverses, it's those 10% that actually survive and can continue to find the right optimal living conditions. And so by having, always having some population that, that is sort of misaligned with this field, they sort of can last beyond uh, a geomagnetic reversal. They don't go extinct or anything like that. This is another a uh, transmission electron microscope image that actually shows a cell at the end stages of mitosis there. You can see all of the little individual magnetite crystals that are there that are being passed on to the two daughter cells. This is an image that actually shows the magnetization between individual grains and sort of how it creates that nice dipolar magnet that's used by those things. So we, we see a lot of this kind of thing in, in biology. There's tons of organisms that have magnetic minerals in them. I know it's never a good strategy to teach by putting up a great big table on the screen, but I couldn't help doing that here just because of all these different organisms. It's incredible how many organisms actually produce magnetic minerals for navigation, for hardening in some instances, uh, all different kinds of things. So I just wanted to try and put that up there. Humans are also on there as well. Um, there's been a lot of studies on whether or not humans have magnetoreception in some form or another. Uh, but something that is now undeniable is that if you just look at electric maps of human brains and you change the magnetic field around a person, something is happening inside your brain. And we don't know what, but it's very clear that it's an unconscious response to a changing magnetic field. And so we're trying to try and figure out that. Uh, that's a, a group out of Caltech that's focusing on that kind of research primarily. So. This is a sort of broad survey of applications of magnetic minerals. We've talked a little bit about uh, pollution and, and biology, and I want to transition now over to archaeology, of all things. So it's a little bit of an abrupt change, but, but bear with me here for a second. A lot of archaeological processes, when you uh, fire a pot in a kiln or something like that, it cools down in the Earth's magnetic field, and it, it records the ambient field at the last time that that pot was hot. If you, have a, if you go camping and you have a fire, the ground where you've had that fire is actually cooling in the presence of the Earth's magnetic field, and it records that magnetization from the last time that fire was actually warm. The Earth's magnetic field changes on human timescales. For those of you who've looked at topographic maps, there's a little uh, magnetic declination arrow on the sides of most topographic maps that you need to adjust your compass by. If your maps were made in the 50s or the 60s, the Earth's magnetic geomagnetic North Pole is in a totally different place now than it was when the map was actually produced. This plot over here on the left is a, a view of the North Pole and the black dot in the center is the geographic North Pole. I'm going to play a movie that's going to show this wandering yellow point. That's the geomagnetic North Pole and it's going to show you how it's migrated around since 1500. And so the idea here, the colors are telling you about how the strength of the field is varying as well. But you can see the, the little migration of the geomagnetic North Pole. It's tracing a path through time. This is only 500 years of, of, motion, of motion. If you collect information from various well-dated sources, you can put together a map of where the Earth's geomagnetic North Pole has wandered through time. So this is a view of the geomagnetic North Pole since uh, for the last 1400 years as viewed from the UK. And the reason this is important archaeologically is if I have a site 
that I can't date by any other means. There's all kinds of archaeological sites where you can't do radiocarbon dating. The preservation just isn't good. But if there's pottery or something that had been heated in the past, we can collect that sample in a very careful, oriented way. And then we can figure out where the magnetic north pole was at the time that that sample was last hot. And if it falls at a place, then we can actually try and estimate the age of that sample based off of its magnetization. So it's a really useful dating tool. So to do this, we get to travel all over the world to some really exciting archaeological places to go do this kind of work. This is something that my group does do a fair amount of. We've gone to Peru, we've gone to Egypt, we've gone to all kinds of places in Mexico and in Greece. South Africa, uh, you name it. We go to these sites to, to collaborate with archaeologists and we collect very carefully oriented uh, specimens. We're putting little bits of plaster of Paris down and putting down little bubble level, spirit level, so we know the, the exact orientation of something. We often scribe north arrows on these kinds of things and we can take the samples back to the lab and then actually figure out what their magnetization is. This is one of our students who is working in Peru and so she was getting right down into one of these hearth sites uh, from an ancient culture called the Moche uh, culture in Peru way back. But some of her results, uh, this goes back. We bring them back to the lab. We do all of our experiments to isolate that little tiny recording. And we can actually date the age of the archaeological artifact very, very precisely, which is kind of nice. Uh, one of the ways that we do this from a sort of computational level is the inclination of the, the sample's magnetization or the dip down. Uh, that's the estimate that we get in the lab is this flat line here. We compare that to some sort of reference curve that we have going back through time. And we say, all right, if we're measuring an orientation along that black line, the sample can either be this age, that age, or this age. And we can create these probability distributions that suggest what the highest probability match is for that sample. These dashed lines are actually giving you your margin of error that you're using to determine the tails on those probability distributions. The declination is the azimuth of the direction. And so we can combine both these things together along with the, the intensity of the magnetization, all of those things together to actually give us a very precise age estimate on the, the age of the archaeological sample. So this is something that's happening with increasing frequency. We calibrate this kind of method all the time wherever we can using radiocarbon, using optically stimulated luminescence dating. Uh, it's it's holding up very, very nicely. Uh, we can use anything that's been heated. It can be a ceramic piece. It can be an old hearth. It can be an old bread oven. It can be chert and flint that have been heated so you can make them more nappable to make better arrowheads. It can even be metallurgical slag. Uh, do you guys all know King Solomon, the story from the Bible? He had a whole bunch of copper mines. It turns out that we can actually go to those copper mines now where they, they actually were. When they were actually doing all this smelting in biblical times, the waste rock that they separated away from the copper, they would just dump that down onto the ground and it would cool, almost like a little lava flow. And they'd create these huge piles of these man-made lava flows. So we can actually go back and use King Solomon's mines to actually create reference curves of how the geomagnetic field was changing with time, which is kind of cool. This is all just basic magnetism. All right, last transition and the last area. We're going to switch over towards environmental change. Um, part of the, the transition here is in certain archaeological projects, they're trying to understand why or how environmental change may have changed cultures. And then modern scientists, and hopefully many of you, are interested in past environmental change to try and predict what's going to be coming down the road for the rest of us uh, for the environmental change that's happening now. Uh, and so magnetism can actually inform some of this stuff. Uh, if any of you study soils, for example, uh, what I'm showing you here is a, a soil pit that's been dug into a modern soil in Texas. And I'm showing you magnetic susceptibility uh, as a function of depth. And so you can see that it reaches this really high point right near the very top of the soil. And then it attenuates with depth down to sort of background levels. What I want you to take away from this is that these, there's magnetic minerals that are forming in all modern soils that are sort of mitigated by biological communities, little microbes and things that are living in the soil that are producing magnetic minerals. And they're producing magnetic minerals in equilibrium with average rainfall conditions and average temperature. So if I were to go all around the world and collect samples from the upper 20 centimeters of soils all around the world and plot it against mean annual precipitation that we knew because we measured it, we might get a plot that looks like this. 
So I'm showing you annual rainfall here on the x-axis and susceptibility on the y-axis. So it's magnetic susceptibility. And it's a log scale on the y-axis there. You can fit a mathematical function to this data. Uh, sort of, this is a conceptual one. It's not an actual regression fit or anything like that. But the idea here is that you can fit, in this case, a log function to that data. And then you can have some measure of the, the standard deviation of the re residual around that mean. And you get a pretty good statistical fit to the data. And so now what we can do is we can go to an, uh, a site uh, where there may be a soil that we don't know much about the environment. We can measure that soil's susceptibility. And we can estimate what precipitation would have been like in the past. Where would we do this? There's this place called the Chinese Lust Plateau. Uh, this is dust that has blown off glaciers uh, for millions of years and has largely settled in these plains in China. It's kilometers thick, uh, but it's a, an active record of soil development over millions of years. So scientists have gone through and have measured magnetic susceptibility throughout this soil sequence. And they can come up with rainfall estimates for the last 12,000 years, which is really important for understanding the various dynasties within Chinese culture and the rise and fall of some of these dynasties in relation to environmental change. But then if you wanted to go further back in time, now we can actually go 1.1 million years back in time using that same approach and show how average rainfall has varied as well. And this allows us to see some of the cyclicity through time that actually relates to changes in the, the planet's orbit around the sun. So these are Milankovitch cycles that we're actually starting to tease out in the magnetic susceptibility record of, of precipitation. So if you want to understand the environment in the past, you can actually do that using magnetic susceptibility. I was in a geology class here earlier this morning where we were talking about different ways of actually imaging magnetization. Magnetization is kind of an invisible force, so it's hard for a lot of people to identify with and have a deep appreciation of. We're developing tools to actually image what's there. And here's just one example. This is uh, one of these squid detectors that I mentioned to you guys earlier, that little superconducting loop of wire that's right there. For it to be superconducting, it has to be really cold. It has to be on the order of 4 degrees Kelvin, so really, really, really cold. And there's a little sapphire window here that protects the cold side from your sample. This is just a polished specimen. If you imagine a little grain there that's magnetized with its little stray magnetic fields, as we move this sensor across this polished surface, we actually get a measure of the magnetic flux going down. That's what we see here. And then as we go directly over the grain, we get a nice little peak, and then we go down again. And so we can actually create profiles across samples. One of the calibration tools that's used for this kind of, this is a picture of the sensor itself. But one of the, the calibration tools that we use is actually US currency. Um, I don't know if many people are aware of this. The, the ink that is used to print US currency is actually magnetic on purpose. It's a counterfeit measure. Uh, we can actually tell which machines have, print, have printed which kinds of dollar bills based off of the specific magnetization and how the magnetization is oriented. But this is George Washington's face on a $1 bill. And this is a magnetic map of his eye. And so it's almost like a little tiny aeromagnetic map over that uh, tiny area of the bill. So we can see, why am I showing you this? Why do you care? It's because we can actually image natural materials now at really, really fine scales. So you remember this image way at the beginning of the talk? Way at the beginning of the talk? This is a stalagmite from Minnesota. I collected this stalagmite. It was actively growing at the time. And so we know its precise age at the very top. You guys see these nice little curves right there? Those are flood layers. Let me tell you a little bit about how those form. Caves are really unique. I don't know if any of you guys have gone caving around here in the past or anything like that. During big thunderstorm events, caves can back up with water really, really fast. And it's really muddy water for the most part. And it takes a while for that water to drain away after the rainstorm is over. But as it drains away, it leaves behind a little film of clay minerals and other sort of particles on the surface of all the stalagmites that are growing on the inside of the cave. And then once you get drip water conditions starting up again, right on the splash surface that you can see right there, the, the splash goes off to the side, calcite minerals continue to grow, and that flood layer gets preserved inside the speleothem itself. That flood layer contains all kinds of magnetic minerals. So we can magnetize our sample and then use that scanning tool to map out the precise location of all of those individual flood layers. Not all of those dark surfaces are flood layers. Some of them are just hiatuses or pauses in growth. And so we want to be able to distinguish 
flood layers from pauses. And that's what this particular image is actually showing us there. We can use that information to invert and figure out exactly the location of these different flood layers. And then I can create a profile as a function of time that actually shows when we had floods. So this is 1500 calendar years. This is the modern day, or close to the modern day. And anytime you see a spike here in that record, that's when there's been a flood in the past. Do you guys all see there's a kind of difference in the kinds of peaks that we're getting? These peaks are all tall and really, really narrow. These are a little bit shorter and wider. There's something different about those peaks. Uh, I can plot the width of those peaks as a function of time, and you can see all the ones before about 1900 are pretty narrow. So it's the width and the y-axis there, whereas the ones after 1900 are really wide. Um, we can actually go in and explore that a little bit, and try and understand why that might actually be. One of the nice things about living in Minnesota is when all the, the Scandinavian immigrants came over and started up farming practices there, they measured daily precipitation. Uh, since about 1890. And so I can look back at these daily precipitation logs going back into the 1890s. And for every individual one of these flood layers that we're detecting magnetically, I can find whether or not there was a big precipitation event. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of data points here. And basically what we're finding is that anytime we actually find a flood layer in the speleothem, in the stalagmite, there's been an unusually large precipitation event that we have something that's greater than 99.9% .9 of all the other precipitation events in the record. And so it's an extreme hydrologic event. This is a flood record for, the, for Minnesota. All of this stuff is tied to land use in Minnesota. So that 1900 date where we start to see this really big increase in the, the width of the, the magnetic flood records there, that corresponds in time with the development of European style agriculture in Minnesota. So at the same time, if we go back to historical records and look up census records that tell us about how many acres were being farmed at any given time and the average acreage of a farm through time, all these kinds of things, we can actually see that we saw a very large and sudden increase in farming uh, that peaked at about 1900 or so, which correlates pretty well with our magnetic record there. Europeans are coming in, they're sawing down all the trees, they're breaking up and plowing all the land. And that increased the amount of magnetic minerals that are moving down through the landscape into the caves and getting incorporated into these speleothems. So when we look at speleothems like this, we can actually see our own social history and our own land use history, uh, our own ways of interacting with the environment, which is kind of fun. So to wrap up, thank you guys for letting me talk to you about all this stuff. Hopefully one of the things you take away from all this talk is that magnetic minerals really are everywhere in all kinds of materials. Uh, they can be used to learn about the shape and the behavior of the Earth's magnetic field. That's a sort of standard paleomag kind of approach that we've taken for decades. But then there's also all these other clever ways that people are using magnetic minerals to explore all kinds of different processes. Pollution, biology, archaeology, and climate change. If any of this is interesting to you guys and you would be curious about learning more about uh, magnetic minerals, there's a national lab at the University of Minnesota called the Institute for Rock Magnetism. And we have fellowship programs where anybody can apply for undergrads, for graduate students, as well as faculty. And we take all of those applications. We invite you to come to use our lab. We teach you how to use everything. Uh, we basically want to contribute to your own research in some way. So if you're interested in this, check out our lab's website, or you can just write to me directly. We want as many people coming to use the lab as possible. And then I am contractually obliged to put up this last slide about the Mineralogical Society of America. As far as professional societies go, the Mineralogical Society of America is fantastic. There's tons of great publications, all kinds of really great opportunities for students as well as faculty and everybody in between. Uh, so if you haven't had a chance to check out the Mineralogical Society of America, please do so. Thank you very, 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 very much for listening. Are there any questions, or have I stunned you all into silence? Silence it is. All right. Shoot. OK. So um, since equal magnetism supported um, the theory of C4 spreading and ultimately plate tectonics, yeah. 
So like, what's the next big thing kind of thing in Paleo Mag? Is that kind of what you mean? I guess so. Yeah, well, yes. So the big achievement of the paleomagnetic community that sort of reached an apex in the 90s was we had this incredible record of all the reversals through time that we could get our hands on. So we could go back for all the way back to about 250 million years using the ocean record to figure out how many reversals there were. And that was really exciting. We could use that for all the reasons I talked about, for dating things, everything. But one of the things that's really captured our attention that we haven't cracked yet as a problem is what about the strength of the Earth's magnetic field? How has it varied through time? How long have we had a dipolar magnetic field on the planet? Like, is it something that we've had for forever? So there's been a real push to try and understand how the strength of the Earth's magnetic field has varied through time. One of the big questions is when the, the solid inner core of the planet nucleated and grew beyond a certain threshold size, did that lead to like a fundamental change in the regime of the Earth's magnetic field? That's been proposed by a lot of modelers, uh, but we don't have enough data to actually test that yet. Other people have been trying to find the oldest rocks they possibly can to see if there's evidence of that dipolar kind of regime that we know now. Uh, and that's been really controversial. People have gone back. Have you heard of a place called the Jack Hills in Australia before? Has anybody heard of those? This is uh, the oldest minerals that we know of on our planet right now. These are zircons that are, in some cases, on the order of around 4.1, 4.2 billion years old. So it's not whole rocks that are still around. It's just fragments from those rocks of that age that have been incorporated into a sandstone that's actually much younger. And there have been people who have used individual zircon crystals and tried to do paleomagnetic studies on individual tiny little zircon studies, uh, zircons, to try and understand whether or not there was a similarly strong magnetic field to what we have now, and if it was likely to be dipolar. And so there's a lot of early Earth questions that we're trying to answer that we think are related to those kinds of questions about whether or not it was dipolar and how strong it was and how that relates to kind of important questions like when was our atmosphere, when did our atmosphere become oxygenated? And did the Earth's magnetic field actually act as a protective envelope for early forms of life on the planet? Like those kinds of big scale questions. So there's a lot of effort going into trying and figuring out the strength of the field and how old the field really, really is. It's an awesome question. Shoot. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. Good question. Um, not very hot at all. Um, so magnetite has a Curie temperature of 580 degrees C, but you don't need to go that hot. So the average, like, well, there's no average fire that's out there. Uh, it depends on how you build the fire. If it's an oxygen poor fire, or an oxygen rich fire, but that's an easy temperature for a fire to get. Uh, if you toss a whole bunch of stones into a, a pouch of water that is boiled. Just the temperature of the boiling water, 100 C, can reset a fraction of your magnetic minerals. And so when we look at those samples that have been partially remagnetized in our magnetometers, we can actually tease out that secondary component that would come from the boiling, for example. So we can actually see boiling events too. It doesn't have to be too hot for us to date. It's pretty nice. Any other? questions about magnetism in general? All right. Well, thank you all so very much. I appreciate it.